Good morning. Christ is risen. We normally do announcements on Easter morning, but this morning let's just go straight to listening to the prelude as we prepare our hearts for worship. Please stand for the call to worship. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. For great is his love towards us. And the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. O oh Lord, our God, we give you thanks and praise. We thank you for sending Christ, your Son, to redeem us from our sins, to rise victorious over the grave. And so we give you thanks and praise. We ask that you would help us to worship you as we ought, that your Spirit would be at work in our midst, that we would have ears to hear your word, and that you would encourage us by your grace. We pray this in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. Let us sing together of our Lord's triumph over sin and Satan and the grave. Christ the Lord is risen today.
giants we call death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way, but he came and he died and he rose. Those giants are dead now. This is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. Please be seated. Let's now affirm our faith using the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven, and sits on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead 
and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now let us give attention to the reading of God's word. This morning's scripture reading is Luke chapter 24. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home, marveling at what had happened. That very day, two, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, 
peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus told his disciples that he went to the cross and came back from the grave in order that, verse uh, 47, that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. If you trust in the name of Christ, that means your sins are forgiven. That means we are free to continually acknowledge our struggles, our failures, our wandering, and again and again come back to trusting in Christ's righteousness and in him alone. Let's use this prayer of confession as we acknowledge that Christ alone is our hope. Our gracious Father, you sent your Son to die and rise to new life in order that death might be brought to an end and that we too might live a new life. Yet foolishly, we have chosen death over life. In our thoughts, words, and deeds, we have rebelled against you and your intentions for us. In so doing, we have broken our fellowship with you, whose love is better than life, and whom to know is life itself. In so doing, we have hurt others, sometimes unintentionally and sometimes deliberately, and have harmed their lives. In so doing, we have damaged ourselves, who have been created to reflect your beauty. Father, forgive us our sin for Jesus' sake and grant that your spirit, by whom you rose Jesus from the dead, might enable us to walk in your ways, the ways of love, justice, and faithfulness, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. For all who trust in the name of Christ, hear the assurance of forgiveness. Surely, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Amen. Let us stand and praise Christ's name. to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree he's 
Please be seated. Let us look to God in prayer. O oh Lord, our God, we thank you for the hope that we have in Christ. Thank you that in your love, you sent Jesus to save us. And God, we pray that each and every day we would grow in your grace, that we, you would do your work, that you would be maturing us and helping us to grow up in the faith to grow in our love for you, to grow in our dependence upon you, and that you would strengthen us to serve you each and every day. Father, we pray that here in York County, here in the United States and throughout the world, that you would send forth your word with power, that people all around the globe would hear the good news that you are a God of love, that you came to save, that you came to us when we were running from you that you would gather people into your church that 
the Lord Jesus would seek the lost sheep and bring them home to safety. Father, all of us in this room have loved ones, family, friends, community that do not know you. God, you have had mercy on us and we do not deserve it. And we pray that your spirit would work powerfully and that you would have mercy on those we are thinking of even now. And Father, even as we praise your name and give you thanks, even as we long for our Lord to come, to come, even as we rejoice in the blessing of good days, beautiful spring days like this one you've given us, we also grieve that this is still a difficult and broken and fallen world, a world in which accidents happen, in which there is unexpected tragedy. We think of the families that lost loved ones in the accident on the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Father, please comfort those who mourn, the family members, the friends, Please be with those who find themselves in hardship because of how their livelihood has been upended. Father, we pray that you would have mercy on the Baltimore community as the rebuilding begins. And God, closer to home, there are many here that face struggles and difficulties and trials. And even as we rejoice to remember Christ's resurrection, we ask, Father, that you would hold on to us and help us in our time of need. In the silence of this moment, we lift up our needs to you. Father, we thank you that you love to hear the prayers of your children. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your word. We thank you that your word gives us all that we need for this life. Thank you that our Lord taught us even how to pray. And so we pray together with one voice saying, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The offering boxes in the back. I did want to just remind everyone uh, that in the uh, seat pocket in front of you, somewhere around you, there is a, a card. One side is a place for prayer requests. If anyone has matters for prayer, whether they're small or great, please feel, feel, feel free to fill that out and drop it in the box. On the other side, there's a, a welcome. If you're new to this church, you've, this is your first time, you've only come a couple times, uh, please feel, feel free to fill that out and drop that in the offering box. We'd love to uh, greet you more personally. Uh, but at this time, let us stand as we give praise to God, singing of Christ resurrection from the grave. Just 
please turn in your bulletins or in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15. As you're turning there, we are looking at the cross and the resurrection and how they are at the center of the Christian faith. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Let us look to God. Lord our God, we thank you for this word, and we pray even now that you would be at work among us. We ask this in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. Some events have tremendous impact. If you've been paying attention to the regional news this week, you're aware of one of those events. Uh, I, it's not going to be a surprise to most of you in this room to hear about the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapse. It was a shocking event to wake up on March 26 and find out about 1.30 in the morning that that entire 1.6-mile bridge was down. You probably saw the video of the 96,000-ton moving ship whose power had failed momentarily, leading to loss of control, plowing into the uh, pylon and bringing the bridge down. The uh, uh, governor of Maryland called the police officers heroes. When the Mayday call went out, they rushed to stop traffic, and they had about 90 seconds to spare before the ship hit. Sadly, there were construction crews up there. I, I know you're probably aware of the details. Tremendous impact. The impact wasn't just literal in bringing down the bridge, the human lives involved, the families that are touched by that, but also many people's livelihoods. Port workers. This is the third uh, busiest port on the East Coast. Uh, brings in the uh, busiest for bringing in autos. It's had a ripple effect in shipping all across the world. And then the regional response, the rebuilding cost, and everything will be scrutinized. There will be investigation after investigation after investigation. There will probably be lawsuits. Tremendous impact. And it's going to impact the Baltimore region for quite a while to come. Even down to whether you travel to Baltimore for work or have to run down to BWI to pick up a friend or go somewhere yourself, traffic patterns will be different for a long time to come. History is full of tremendously significant events. What we celebrate at Easter, what we celebrate every Sunday, is the most significant event in all of world history, and not an event that caused harm, but an event that is significant because of the fact that it is the hope of the world. We celebrate Christ's death, in Christ's resurrection. What I want to do this morning is simply look at 1 Corinthians 15 and help us see why this is the most significant event in all of history. Ever since the creation of the world, ever since sin entered the world uh, because of Adam and Eve, this is the most significant event. Why do I say this? What I want us to see is how Paul argues that this event, Jesus' death, and his resurrection is of first importance. So first we will see these matters are of first importance. Secondly, we will see 
the certainty we have about these matters, that these are real historical events. And third, we'll see the impact that Jesus did these things to bring about complete salvation of first importance with great certainty for complete salvation. Of first importance. Now, what, what matters most? I, I'm going to do something we don't normally do. I'd like to invite any kids to come forward. We got a little illustration this morning, and the kids will enjoy seeing it. And while kids are coming, I'm, while I'm saying this up, if anyone wants to come up here so you can see it, I know we don't normally do this. If there's no takers, that's fine. But it's going to take me a minute to set up, so I thought I'd call people forward. So uh, this illustration I'm about to do here, I know a lot of you probably can't see. Here's some rocks. No kids want to come up? That's fine if you don't. Uh, we've got a bucket full of sand. All right, one brave person, wonderful. You can have a seat here next to Ruby if you want. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about priorities in life. And this illustration gets used by people that make their living telling people how to have healthy lives. And what they talk about is how in order to have a balanced life, you've got to get the priorities first. Things like health, diet, exercise, sleep, things like that. Things like having meaning and purpose in life. Uh, work that matters, things like relationships, having healthy relationships, and it goes on and on. There's a lot of priorities, and they talk about how to make sure you can get all your priorities to fit. Now, if I want to get the priorities to fit and get this lid on, see, I've got all this sand here, so I'm going to do my best, and I did this at home. I got to go fast because there's lots of people in the back. I did this at home. I can't get the lid on, right? See that? Now, what happens if you start with the priorities and then put the extra things in around? Do you think I'll be able to get it to fit? I'm going to try. I might mess up. All right, first we got to get the sand out of the way. All that time on social media, watching those TV shows. Once we have, uh, once we start thinking about our life and thinking about what matters, we want to make sure those things are set. H having healthy lives, good diet, making sure we have healthy friends, having work that really matters. Once we have all the rocks in, then we can add the extra things that are a good part of life, but aren't high priority. Let's see, we're almost there. We still got a little bit more sand to fit in. Look at that. It fits nicely. There's even margin. Time to do what you want to do. And it fits on nice and easy. Now, the point of this is a reminder that there are some things that are more important. But my question is what's most important? So I, if you guys have listened to my sermons, you probably know I really like ice cream. When it comes to sweets, I think that hard candy is good, donuts are better, ice cream is best. Do you know what Psalm 63 says? Because your love is better than life, my lips will praise you. There are some things that are really good, good priorities, but you know what the most important priority is? Our relationship with God, that is of first importance. Okay, thank you for coming up so you could see as they're making their way back to their seats here. It is true that there are a lot of things people say are important, but we all have to consider what things are most important. The things of most importance, the nature of reality, what it means to be human. Is there a God? How would I know? What is the good life in light of the answer to those questions? In, a diff in addition to Psalm 63, 3, Jesus tells us in Matthew 4, as he's quoting Deuteronomy, that uh, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus tells us in Matthew 6, 33, that people are constantly trying to look for food, including other things, and he says, seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. There are matters of great importance, how we structure our lives, but then there are matters of first importance. And notice what Paul tells the church here. Look with me in verse 3. I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Notice the first thing here. Paul didn't come up with this on his own. 
He received it. What does it mean to know God? Do I go out and figure things out myself? Am I the one that comes to God? What Paul is telling us here is that God is the one that has spoken, has given us his word, and God is the one who has acted. Notice of first importance isn't I figure out how to get to know God, but what does he say is of first importance? Christ came and lived, Christ died, went to the grave, and rose from the grave. What's of first importance is what God has done. God is the one who has acted. God is the one who has spoken. God is the one who has intervened. And this is of first importance. And this is what the church has passed down. Notice that he says uh, more than one time in accordance with the scriptures. We could spend the entire rest of this sermon showing how Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled in Christ, how it was in accordance with the scriptures. But if we did that, I wouldn't get to everything that's here and that roast in the oven might get burned. So I'm simply going to say there are lots of great books in this and I want us to keep going and notice what things Paul says. What's the first importance? That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. This is what we celebrated on Good Friday, that Jesus died in our place. You probably saw many Christians were passing around a a comic that on Facebook, it shows a guy looking out, looking at some birds flying. He's sitting on this cliff and he says, I hate the term Good Friday. And his friend says, why? He says, my Lord was hanged on a tree that day. And his friend says, if you were going to be hanged on that tree and he volunteered to take your place, how would you feel? Good? Have a nice day. (laughs) Christ died for our sins. Do you trust him? That he volunteered to take your place. And he was buried and was raised on the third day. His resurrection shows us his victory. It shows us that Jesus has defeated death, sin, in Satan, that the renewal of all things has uh, begun through his resurrection. He is the new Adam. He is the true Israel. He is the strong man who has bound Satan. He is the lamb who is slain and now reigns forever. He's the Messiah who has come and will come again to restore all things. These are the matters of first importance. Yes, it's important to have priorities in life. Yes, whether you're thinking about your life as a whole or how to run a business, if you don't think through priorities, important things will get crowded out by the tyranny of the urgent. But those are only the better things. What's the best? What's of first importance? And it's what God has done in sending his son to live, to suffer and die, and to rise victorious. Some of you may say, This all sounds fine and good, but I've read comic books and I've read fairy tales. The next thing I want to remind us of is the great certainty that we have. Consider how we know things. Uh, On the one hand, we can learn things through what logicians call abductive reasoning. Now, I know that for uh, a lot of the kids in this room, that's a big word. This is circumstantial reasoning. Let me help you explain how abductive reasoning works. It's when you're taking circumstances and adding them up to come to a conclusion. So here's an example. We have two dogs. One of them's a young, active puppy, a little, about a year and a half old. And our young dog is named Spin. The name fits her. She loves butter. She's probably not alone if I give show of hands. How many people in this room will love butter? She loves to eat the whole stick all at once, right away. We have to be very careful about leaving her uh, alone in the kitchen. Now, say we run to change the laundry and she's out in the kitchen and we're not watching her. And we hear the jingle of the collar and we run back in and there she is licking her lips right on the floor. And where the butter dish was, the butter is gone and there's dog hair sitting on her counter abductive reasoning, circumstantial logic would tell you the dog got on the counter. Now, it's possible that a child who also loves butter ran through the house and grabbed a little stick of butter, but very unlikely. The children don't do that. The dog has a pattern of doing that. That's circumstantial reasoning. What, though, what about, though, when uh, you come back in and your uh, child is sitting there working at the counter and says, I saw the dog jump up. I chased the dog away. You have direct eyewitness testimony. 
Sometimes circumstantial reasoning can get it wrong. Uh, sometimes eyewitness testimony does. But eyewitness testimony is one of the surest ways we know anything about the truths of history. Historic truth is communicated through eyewitness testimony. Yes, using archaeology, we can reason abductively and learn things. There's a lot you can learn from archaeology, but direct testimony is the best way to learn about what happened in history. And so historians make their whole living based off of going to primary sources to learn about history. Consider just one example. If you go down to Washington, D.C., there's an incredibly sobering museum, the Holocaust Museum. And it documents how absolutely evil humanity can be. I don't recommend going there flippantly. It's a difficult museum to go through. The circumstantial evidence, the piles of shoes, the piles of cut hair. But there's also the photographs and the written human testimonies of what the soldiers saw. And the U.S. government, as they uh, freed Germany from Nazi reign, was careful to seek to uh, document it so that future generations could say never again. The sad reality is there are still Holocaust deniers out there. And yet, if we give up on eyewitness testimony, in principle, we give up on our ability to know anything about history. Notice the great uncertainty that we have of Christ's resurrection. Look with me in verse 5. He appeared to Cephas, that's the name for Peter, then to the 12, the 12 apostles that were uniquely chosen. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. So if you want to know if Paul's telling the truth, you can go look up their addresses, you can travel, you can interview them, you can find out. Then he appeared to James, that's probably Jesus' brother, then to all the apostles. Last of all, so when untimely of born, he appeared also to me. Then on the road to Damascus, Paul saw Jesus with his own eyes. Peter is saying, look at the, or Paul is saying, look at the certainty that you have. Look at how many eyewitnesses there are. How many people saw him. Now, whenever critical scholars read this, they come up with all sorts of arguments. Oh, it's mass hallucination. They all had the same bad reaction to that fish that wasn't cooked properly. When people hallucinate, they don't hallucinate the same thing. They just don't. There's not evidence of that ever happening. Well, some people say it's a, it's a great uh, conspiracy. They all agreed that this is what happened. Why do people come up with conspiracies? Because there's some goal that they want to help them gain something. What did the apostles have to gain by lying and knowing that they were lying? So far as we know, almost all the apostles either died for their testimony or were exiled for their testimony. Now, some of them, it's the historical records less clear than others. How could they go their whole lives knowing they were dying for a lie? Now, yes, I know some people say, yeah, but religious fanatics die today still. Religious fanatics die because they're trusting in someone else's witnesses. There's a huge difference between trusting in someone else's witness and saying, I am an eyewitness to these things. I know that this is true. This is why the Christian church is called an apostolic faith. We trust in the eyewitness testimony of the apostles. If you reject this testimony in principle, how do you ever know anything about history? We have great certainty to the Christian faith, a certainty that trusts in the apostolic witness. The only thing that possibly makes sense is that they were telling the truth about what they had seen and experienced. There's no other good explanation for why they walked into decades of suffering to say, we have seen him risen from the grave. What does this mean uh, for us today? This is a reminder that we can trust in the Gospels, that we can trust the eyewitness accounts, that we can trust in the physical, bodily, real 
historic life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. If Christianity were a fable, only true in some kind of mythical sense, I'm not sure it'd be worth following. But that's not what the Gospels teach. The Gospels teach that Christianity is true in history. That these things actually happened. That thanks be to God, God himself entered our world for the purpose of living the life we couldn't, dying in our place, and rising from the grave, something that had never happened before in history in that manner. There were resurrections. There was always a prophet doing it. Jesus rose of his own accord. And this happened so that we could have assurance of the truth of Christianity. So we've seen a first importance with great certainty. Last of all, for complete salvation. Notice why Paul is saying this. Verse 1, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you. He's saying, you know these things, but you need the reminder. Why do we need the reminder? It's easy for all of us to make other things of first importance, even good things. Maybe it's uh, physical health, diet, exercise, sleep. Those are good things. But knowing Jesus is even more important than physical health. Because your love is better than life, my lips will praise you, Psalm 63, 3. It's easy for us to be uh, overcome by anxiety or concern or the cares of this world and to forget what's of first importance. And what's of first importance is that God reconciles to himself all who trust in Christ. And so you see that Paul says here, I would remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received. Have you received this good news? Have you trusted that Christ died for you? for your sins, for your sake, that he went to that cross because of his love for you. Many in this room have. And this passage reminds us that this is the grace in which we stand, that our hope is in God's love shown at the cross. But if you've never trusted Christ, I would invite you to do so this morning. Jesus tells us that if we trust him, if we believe in him, that he will give eternal life, that he will bring about reconciliation between us and God. This is a salvation that we experience the moment we trust Christ, and yet the fullness of it has not yet happened yet. So verse 2, by which you are being saved. Why is he put in this sense? Because they've come to Christ, but they're waiting for Christ to return. They're waiting for the end when Jesus restores the world, when there's no more sin, sickness, and death. Do you trust Jesus? Have you received his grace? this, This complete salvation also reminds us that we live the Christian life as we trust in his grace. Receiving Christ's forgiveness means that we become his disciple, that we submit to him, that we acknowledge him as our Savior and Lord, that we listen to his word day in and day out. Paul uses a very unique phrase at the beginning and end of Romans. He talks about the obedience of faith. He's not saying that faith saves. He's not saying that God loves us because of anything we'll do. No, this very passage reminds us our only hope is God in love coming to us. And yet if we trust Christ, it means that he begins to transform our lives. And so look in verse uh, 9 through 11. Paul says, I'm the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle. And why? Because I persecuted the church of God. He's saying, I was fighting against God, and God saved me. And look at how God's grace changed him. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. So notice what Paul reminds us is that we stand in God's grace, that we grow by grace. He says, yes, I worked hard. I I sought to fall after God, but I'm not boasting in any deeds of my own. This was God's grace in me. My only hope is the grace of God. And yet what was he doing? He was seeking to pursue that grace. What does it practically look like? to grow in this grace. 
a uh, pastor over in uh, Lancaster, uh, Chris Walker at uh, Westminster, recently quoted John Owen's book, and he quoted this, our minds are apt to be filled with troubles, fears, cares, dangers, distresses, ungoverned passions and lusts. But where the soul is fixed on the glory of Christ, then the mind finds rest and peace. Let me read that line again. But where the soul is fixed on the glory of Christ, then the mind finds rest and peace. If we desire strong faith and a powerful love, we must seek them by diligently beholding the glory of Christ by faith. On Christ's glory, I would fix all my thoughts and desires. And the more I see of the glory of Christ, the more the painted beauties of this world will wither in my eyes. And I'll be more and more crucified to this world. What is Owen saying? He's saying, behold your God, behold your Savior, behold the Lamb slain for our salvation, that he did that because of his great love, because of the joy set before him, because he wanted to call a people to himself from every nation, every tribe, every language. And when we keep our gaze fixed on his love, then our lives are transformed. Our lives are transformed by us saying, I got to perform for God to love me. It's the grace of God in us working itself out as we trust in him. The present grace as we look forward to the end of the story, the end of salvation. And this means, this complete salvation means that even when we can't see the story, as we seek to serve God day in and day out in the mundane things, in the exciting things, on the wonderful days, on the hard days, as we daily trust Christ, it means that our every decision is significant and valuable and matters. Listen to 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. Now, when it talks about work of the Lord, this doesn't just mean telling other people the gospel, although that's something we're called to do. This doesn't just mean volunteering in some position at church, although that's something we're called to do. This refers to an entire life of discipleship to Jesus. So that everything you do in your job, in your home, in your community, in your relationships, that you should seek to do it for Jesus' sake, for his honor, for his glory, and even when you can't see results, we're assured that knowing that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. At the beginning, we had this illustration about rocks and sand. What kind of life am I building? You see, in order for this illustration makes, to make sense, you really have to know what foundation your life rests on. I'm super excited. Red Lion is getting an Aldi. One of my favorite grocery stores. I've been driving by that place in Cape Horn for months and months and months, and I heard the rumors. The sign wasn't there. It took them so long to lay the foundation. And I was like, I drove by, and I was like, oh, the whole building's up. What just happened? You have to lay the right foundation if you're going to have a building that lasts. This illustration about rocks and sand and priorities, Jesus gives us the most important illustration about rocks and sand in matthew 7 he says anyone who hears his words and does them is like someone that builds upon the rock and no matter the storm their house will stand but those that hear and do not do those that hear and do not uh, submit to his grace that it's like they've built on sand they never took the time to find the right foundation and their house will crumble when the storms come all of us face storms what's of first importance is have we built on the rock? Have we heard the gospel and responded in faith? I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received. The matters of first importance, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. But this isn't just myth or legend. We have great certainty, this list here, of the eyewitnesses of his glory. And the result is complete salvation, that we are saved the moment we trust in Christ, that the grace of God is what sustains us, and that we have hope for the end of time when Christ comes again.
This is what we celebrate, not just on Easter Sunday, but every Sunday as we gather as the people of God to worship our Lord. Let us look to God in prayer. Oh, Lord, our God, we thank you for your grace. Thank you for reminding us of the matters of first importance. Thank you that you sent your son and that you worked in this world, in our history, to bring about complete salvation. Hallelujah, what a savior. We praise your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we celebrate communion, we're going to have some special music to give us all a time to reflect and to worship God together as we remember the hope that we have through Christ's death and Christ's resurrection. Separated the bleachers far too wide from the far side of the chasm, you held me in your side. So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here.
the blood of life. Glory to His name. As we come to the celebration of the supper, this is the table of the Lord Jesus. This is for all who have been baptized and publicly acknowledge their hope and faith in Christ. If that describes you, be strengthened this morning. This table reminds us of Christ's death and his resurrection. That he, the broken bread and poured out wine reminds us of his body and blood broken on the cross. And he tells, tells us to celebrate this until he comes again. In other words, this table reminds us of the resurrection, that we are only partaking of this until we see him face to face. Yes, we trust in the eyewitnesses. We don't ourselves see Jesus bodily yet, but he does give us something to strengthen our faith. He gives us this supper. He tells us this is for our strengthening, that as surely as we eat, as surely as we drink, if we trust in Christ, so surely are our sins washed away, and so surely do we know that he will come in glory to restore all things. And so he gives us this supper to give us real grace, real strength as we await his return. So if that describes you, Come forward with gratitude and trust and faith this morning. If that doesn't describe you, I would encourage you to consider Christ's death and resurrection, that today is the day of salvation, that the good news is going out through all the world as God calls people from all over to trust in Christ, trust in him today. Let us look to God our Savior. Oh, Lord God, we thank you that you have given us grace for this present journey. And we pray that you would be spiritually at work among us even now, that you would strengthen us by your grace. For we pray this in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. For it was on the night that our Lord was betrayed, they took bread, and then he gave him thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body broken for you. In the same manner, after supper, he also took the cup saying, this cup is the blood of the new covenant, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let us therefore with one voice proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. As the communion service come forward, I would remind you there is uh, regular and gluten-free bread. Uh, there's wine and grape juice. The grape juice is the white. Or the grape juice is the white wine.
Christ's body broken for you. The cup of salvation, let us drink together. Oh, Lord God, we give you thanks and praise for your grace to us. We thank you that you have acted, that you have brought about salvation. We dedicate our lives to you in response to your grace, and we ask that you would strengthen us by grace. We trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as we sing together.
again, hear God's benediction, his word of blessing upon all of his people. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Amen. Uh, Just a quick reminder for all those that bought flowers to help make the sanctuary beautiful this morning. Please feel free to take them home. Not only those here, but those also over on the windowsill. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. 